back uh, everyone to the uh, to the school. Uh, today we have um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Sandro Scandalo, a pioneer contributor of uh, uh, condensed matter physics uh, with his studies in uh, material science and atomistic simulation. Uh, Sandro is uh, a long-term uh, member of the ICTP, initially the position of a research scientist, then became the head of the condensed matter session and now acting as a research director uh, of the center. Uh, Sandro today will speak about uh, ab initio uh, molecular dynamics with, uh, and uh, actually we have the, uh, the opportunity to test this innovative uh, uh, lecturing uh, methodology where Sandro is uh, uh, hidden somewhere at the ICTP uh, nobody, apparently there is a legend ongoing here in the center that nobody knows where he, where he effectively is. And uh, actually would be uh, the game of today will be to find him out uh, where he's hiding in the center. But meanwhile, uh, we'll enjoy his talk. Uh, and so Sandro, uh, stage is yours. Uh, welcome, uh, also welcome to the school uh, uh, from the organizer. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you everybody for connecting so early in the morning. Uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, to be here, actually, to be uh, testing this uh, system, which, uh, you know, I mean, those of you uh, who uh, know my lectures in solid state physics might uh, know that I like uh, using chalks and blackboards. So uh, this is actually a, a new setup that was uh, created by our scientific uh, uh, the fab lab, the sci fab lab here. Uh, it's still rudimentary, but uh, I'm actually testing with this lecture. So it's uh, you can consider it also as a test of the system. And I hope everything everything works today. So um, uh, the uh, the lecture today will be about ab initio molecular dynamics. Uh, you'll have some tutorials uh, later on, hands on. Um, uh, but since I guess most of you come from the background of uh, electronic structure calculations, uh, the idea is that I will start with some uh, 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 introductory concepts in the field of uh, molecular dynamics. Okay. So my lecture will be uh, structured in more or less two parts. First, I will give you some. Um, brief introduction to the basic concepts of uh, molecular dynamics, uh, and then I will move on to the concept of uh, uh, potential. And, and this is where the ab initio part uh, comes in. Um, and I will also try to uh, show you uh, some simple methods to, uh, to do ab initio molecular dynamics, among which uh, uh, the famous uh, uh, car uh, and Parinello method. I mean, Roberto Carr and Michele Parinello uh, de de developed this method actually here in Trieste. Um, um, almost 40 years ago, uh, 35 years ago, uh, but it's still a method that is, is, is used in practice for, uh, for ab initio molecular dynamics. Okay, so let me start um, with some very basic uh, uh, concept. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is molecular dynamics, first of all? Molecular dynamics essentially consists in simulating the dynamics of uh, uh, molecules, or in fact, the name molecular dynamics is an historical uh, uh, um, in some sense mistake, because we are not just dealing with molecules, we're dealing with atoms, we're dealing with any particles, as a matter of fact, as long as it moves with, uh, with Newton's equations. Uh, so it should be called actually atomic dynamics more than molecular dynamics. So you have a bunch of atoms that you want to uh, study the dynamics of, uh, you have some forces acting on the atoms. Uh, let me introduce some notations here. I will consistently use uh, capital letters for uh, ions, atoms, and small letters for uh, uh, electrons, because electrons will come into play uh, later on, of course, because we're doing ab initio molecular dynamics. For, for the time being, it's just classical, okay? I'm just dealing with the classical system of particles. Uh, each, each particle will have a force attached to it. And uh, the idea is that we want to essentially solve uh, uh, Newton's dynamics for these particles, right? So mass times acceleration. Uh, this is the second derivative. Uh, and this is equal to the force acting on that particular particle, okay? So we want to evolve, we want to solve this problem. And in solving this problem, uh, let me right away mention that uh, there are two aspects which are quite complementary. Uh, one is the aspect of how we're solving this as a, a second order differential equation, because this is what it is in practice, right? It's a second order differential equation uh, in time. And there is another aspect, which is in fact, uh, probably the most interesting one in some sense for us, for our community, for the initial community, which is how I calculate the forces acting on, on the particle. And this is where, of course, the initial uh, 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 you know, theory uh, uh, comes into play. Now, uh, um, when you set up a simulations, you, of course, you have to define uh, the atoms that you have in your system. Uh, for example, this could be a four atom molecule and you, you know, want to study the dynamics of this for a certain amount of time. 
But in most cases, you do have initial molecular dynamics to study behavior of uh, bulky systems, right? Liquids uh, or collections of molecules, water, for example, um, or uh, you know, amorphous systems. So you're actually, uh, your goal is to study systems that are actually you know, macroscopic in size. And I don't need to explain you this concept, right? You're already familiar with the fact with the concept of a simulation cell, uh, where you, of course you restrict your, uh, uh, your system into a given box. And you're also familiar with the concept of periodic boundary conditions. But in, 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 in the concept of periodic boundary conditions in molecular dynamics is a bit more, uh, I mean, it's a bit less obvious because uh, you're dealing with systems that move and you're dealing with systems at finite temperature, you're dealing with liquids, right? So there are no periodic band, well, there, there's no periodicity in a liquid. So what you actually do in practice, if you have a, say, a macroscopic uh, system of particles now, uh, let's imagine that this is, uh, you know, 10 to the 23rd particles, which is roughly the size of, of a macroscopic system, you don't want to study 10 to the 23rd particles in the computer. So you need to, uh, and they're all different in some sense, right? There's no periodicity in principle if this is a liquid. So what do you do in practice? Well, in practice, what you do is essentially that you, I mean, you, 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 you select a subcomponent of your system and you're simulating only that small component based on the availability of your computational resources. It can be a hundred atoms, it can be a hundred thousand, it can be a million atoms depending on the size of your of your computer, the one I mean, that you have that, that you have available. So the first question that you ask yourself if you if you do molecular dynamics is how do I truncate my system? Right? Which kind of uh, boundary conditions I'm going to apply? I'm going to apply to my system. Now um, you are familiar, as I said, with periodic boundary conditions, but this is not obvious at all because periodic boundary conditions, in principle, introduce a spurious periodicity in your in your uh, calculations. Right? If you're dealing, if you're studying a liquid with periodic boundary conditions, you're not studying a liquid. You're studying something which is periodically. In fact, you're studying a crystal, if you uh, if you wish, because even if your simulation box contains, uh, you know, a hundred, a thousand atoms these thousand atoms repeat periodically, right? So there, is, there are some artifacts that are introduced by the, uh, the, 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 the introduction of periodic boundary conditions. In fact, in the early days of, uh, of molecular dynamics, people were not actually using periodic boundary conditions. They were using open boundary conditions. Uh, they were set putting the atoms in a, uh, selecting say a chunk of the system and, and then just put vacuum outside and just calculating the forces uh, between the particles inside this cluster, let's call it cluster. Now, uh, uh, there was a debate, especially historically, uh, uh, whether open boundary conditions were better or worse than periodic boundary conditions. Periodic boundary conditions, you know, from the computational point of view, are slightly more complicated because you have to compute forces coming from you know, infinitely many particles, while with open boundary conditions, you're only uh, uh, looking at forces coming from you know, a finite number of, uh, of atoms. So from the computational point of view, open boundary conditions are slightly uh, easier. Of course, open boundary conditions means that you're exposing a number of atoms to a surface, to the vacuum, right? Which is clearly unphysical um, uh, if your goal is to study uh, a bulk system. I mean, and this is actually quite serious, more serious than perhaps you may imagine. Um, uh, just give you an example. I mean, suppose you take a, a thousand particles, right? And you put them in a, in, a, in a cube with open boundary conditions, right? Suppose that it's a system is simple cubic, right? So you have a thousand particles, you have a cube and the cube is upside, uh, say 10 times 10 times 10, okay? Um, and you're, imagine, you're doing this with open boundary conditions. Now, can you guess the number of particles that are at the surface of this uh, big cube? Well, I mean, I'm sure you're now trying to calculate it, but you have six phases and each phase is, is about a hundred particles. So you immediately realize that more than half of uh, the particles that are in a cube of side 10, so a thousand particles are actually at the surface of this cube, right? You thought that a thousand was a big number, but you realize that you try to take a cube made of a thousand particles, more than half are actually at the surface of this cube. And you don't want to, I mean, clearly the particles at the surface are not going to evolve dynamically like a particle in the bulk, in the bulk because they're actually, I mean, they're, they're at the surface. So there is actually a half of the forces acting on those particles. So you see, you immediately see that open boundary conditions really need to go to very big uh, simulation boxes if you want to uh, achieve you know, something that looks like a bulk state. So something where the vast majority of the particles in your system is actually in a, in a, in a bulk state. I mean, surrounded, completely surrounded by, by other particles. So 
the concept of periodic boundary conditions been in fact taken over as the main way to do uh, boundary conditions in molecular dynamics. Now, there are even more exotic uh, choices. People have experimented something like twisted boundary conditions. These are actually quite common in the, in the field of uh, uh, when you simulate wave functions, because you're also introducing some, some uh, k-point sampling. But that's a different, that's a different, uh, different story. So we discussed uh, um, um, periodic boundary conditions. We so to concluded that what we want to do is to study essentially systems in, in, uh, in inside some simulation box, uh, which is uh, you know representative of a large um, amount of uh, of uh, of particles. We put our particles inside our simulation box, and we uh, uh, we now want to evolve them according to uh, Newton's equations, and we use periodic boundary conditions. That is, if a particle gets to the surface of this. Uh, 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 box, uh, it will automatically re-enter from the other side of the box. We use periodic boundary conditions, okay? So as a matter of fact, what you're studying is not just, uh, you know, completely disordered system, you're just studying a liquid, but you're studying a system which is periodically repeated in, in space. And what you have to make sure is that the size of your simulation box is not introducing some spurious uh, 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 physical, I mean, unphysical effects. Uh, in, uh, in, in the results of your, uh, of your simulation. So you normally try to do bigger sizes, bigger and bigger sizes to try and see whether there is anything in your calculations that depends on the size, uh, uh, which is of course uh, um, uh, something you have to, you have to uh, fix, of course, in your simulations. Okay, so let me now um, go back to the, uh, to the solution of the, um, of the uh, second order equation, which is one of the first steps you have to consider, you know, how am I going to solve this, uh, this uh, second order uh, differential equation? So in order to do that, mm -hmm. oh, well, uh, let me actually share the screen because it's probably faster if I, if I do that. Um, let me go straight to the... Um, uh, to this one here. Okay, I hope you can see this. Uh, yes, I'm sharing the screen. So, uh, as you can see, um, meanwhile, I will, uh, I will uh, erase this uh, <laughs> blackboard. Uh, as you can see, I mean, the goal is to essentially evolve uh, the position of a given particle, which is R i, R capital I, um, uh, with time. And uh, the way you do that is by discretizing space, is discretizing time, sorry. You discretize your, uh, your time in small, uh, in small steps. And I'll come back to the uh, choice of the time step in a moment. And uh, uh, essentially what you, what you want to do is to uh, uh, guess, uh, well, try to come up with the best guess of what will be the position at time t plus delta t once you know the properties of your system at time t for example, position and velocity, and of course the force, because you're calculating the force, right? So based on the force, you want to guess what will be the coordinate of the position, atom i, for example, in this particular example, uh, at time t plus delta t, once you know uh, the position and velocity at time uh, t, right? And this is going to be an iterative procedure. You start with the given positions and velocities, and then you evolve uh, iteratively uh, this process for uh, as long as you want, essentially, as long as your computer resources uh, uh, allow you. Now, there are a number of uh, uh, subtleties in, in, in doing this. Uh, the, the, mo the most important concept that you have to consider is that you want to minimize that uh, particular, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, error that you're making when you truncate this sum, right? Because you know the position, you know the velocity, you know the force, uh, but you don't know what comes next, what comes at the third order in, in delta t. Right? This is the third de derivative of the position with respect, uh, with respect to time. So if you truncate uh, your estimate uh, just after the force, uh, you're going to uh, uh, make an error which, uh, which is of order delta t cube. Mm -hmm. So you want to try and minimize as much as possible uh, that, that error. Okay? So there are a number of uh, tricks uh, and there are several algorithms that uh, uh, try to improve uh, this. Uh, but let me just give you a flavor of how these algor uh, algorithms uh, work with a given example. This is called the Verley uh, algorithm. The Verley algorithm starts from the consideration that if you actually do the same exercise with minus delta t, and I'll show you in a moment why 
it's interesting to look at minus delta t. What you'll find, of course, is something where uh, the, um, the, the terms that change sign are the velocity term, the ones, of course, which are odd in delta t, and of course, the, the term in delta t cube, whatever it is, right? You don't know what it is, but you certainly know that this, this term is going to change sign uh, when you reverse the, uh, the delta t. Of course, the term in delta t fourth will have the same sign and will not uh, will have the same uh, will have the same sign. Now, if you sum these two expression, uh, you just sum you know the left hand side and the right hand side, and what you see is that uh, two things. First, uh, the velocity disappears. Right? You don't need any longer to to know what the velocity is. You just need the positions. Of course, you need to know also the position at time t minus delta t. In other words, your estimate of the position at time t plus delta t depends on the position at time t, position at times minus delta t, the force at time t. And then the interesting thing is that whatever remains, the residual of this uh, uh, calculation is now one order higher in delta t. It's now of order delta t to the fourth. So essentially, you've been able to reduce the, the error that you, are, that you are making. Okay, so this is a very popular, it's probably the most popular algorithm in, in molecular dynamics because it only requires the knowledge of uh, the positions at the previous step and the two steps before the one you're calculating. Okay? And of course the force, because the force is what guides you in, your, uh, in the definition of, of the trajectory. And the error you're making is uh, you order uh, delta t to the fourth. Now you can easily imagine that you can, uh, you know, um, make this algorithm uh, following similar procedures, uh, similar you know, derivation, you can actually, by including memory of the system at time t minus two delta t or t minus three delta t, you can make that error delta t fourth even smaller by going to, the, to delta t to the fifth, delta t to the sixth and so on and so forth. So it can be systematically improved following essentially the same uh, derivation as the one that I've just shown you here for the, uh, for the first order, essentially. So it is, it is, I mean, you have in principle the possibility to make it systematically better if you want, but Verley algorithm is already an extremely stable, uh, uh, an extremely stable algorithm. Um, another, con I mean, another reason why Verley algorithm is, is quite popular, especially in molecular dynamics, is that molecular dynamics uh, simulations are never too long in time because uh, ab initio molecular dynamics is much heavier, computationally speaking, with respect to standard molecular dynamics, right? So with standard molecular dynamics, you can run systems for, uh, you know, even for microseconds. Uh, I mean, there have been simulations that have been running for milliseconds. Uh, with ab initio molecular dynamics instead, you rarely go above, say, one nanosecond, okay? It, typically, the typical ab initio simulations is between one picosecond and one nanosecond, right? So it's actually quite short in time. And errors uh, that come from the uh, integration of the equations of motions are less serious than errors that uh, you do uh, in the case of classical molecular dynamics, where you evolve your trajectory for, um, for, a, for a much, uh, much longer time. Now, let me actually uh, say something about, uh, about uh, delta t now. How do we actually choose uh, delta t? Okay, so let me actually go back to my screen here. And, uh, so uh, I have my time here, uh, my position here uh, as a function of time, and I'm discretizing my uh, uh, trajectory, my time, right? Uh, the distance is delta t, and I'm, of course, I'm evolving uh, my uh, trajectory uh, in, this, uh, in this way, okay? Up, 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 and so on and so forth, right? So I have a discrete set of points which describe uh, more or less uh, 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 the trajectory of my, of my particle, right? And these are discrete points, of course. Uh, so let me, sorry, let me uh, highlight the fact that what I have is not, of course, a continuous set of points, but it's a set of points that are defined only where the uh, delta t, every delta t, right? So this is my, what I call my trajectory. Hmm? Now, how, the question is now, how, how do I choose delta t? Mm -hmm. Of course, I would like to make, uh, there, are, there are two contrasting uh, uh, arguments that I, that I have to take into consideration when I choose delta t, right? Uh, based on what we just discussed, I want to make delta t as small as possible because the smaller is delta t, the better will be my integration. The, the more precise will be my 
uh, estimate of uh, uh, the position at time t plus delta t, right? I'm making this uh, error, which I now uh, uh, discussed, uh, which is of order delta t to the fourth in the case of the Verle algorithm, I'm making it as small as possible. So on one hand, I would like to make delta t as small as possible, mm, tiny. On the other hand, there are some obvious considerations coming from the fact that I want to simulate a, a system for a given amount of time. And the given amount of time is determined by the physics of my problem, right? I want to simulate, I don't know, I mean, the vibrations of a molecule. I need to be able to simulate my system for at least several periods of uh, vibration of my molecule, right? So the physical problem I'm, I'm interested in will set the actual time scale I want to, uh, I need to consider. So if I make delta t too small, the total number of steps that I have to, uh, uh, you know, um, iterate my trajectory uh, uh, will be, of course, uh, inversely proportional to, uh, uh, to delta t. So if delta t is too small, right, obviously, the total trajectory, let me call it t, the total, you know, uh, length of a trajectory will be, of course, a number of steps times delta t. So if delta t is too small, uh, the number of steps uh, uh, will be too large. And so my, the, 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 the the calculation will be uh, will be too uh, too long. It will take too long, right? So I have these two conflicting uh, uh, criteria that I have to somehow try to accommodate. Well, it turns out that at least with the Verle algorithm, um, as a rule of thumb, uh, uh, if you consider the typical fluctuation of your system, okay, which can be here, for example, represented by this roughly, right? Uh, let me call it tau. This is a sort of characteristic time of my system. For example, if I have a, an oscillator, it will be the period of the, uh, of, uh, of the system. This is more or less the, uh, the, the, the time that describes the oscillations, the average for the oscillations of my system. Well, as a rule of thumb, in order to be able to integrate this properly, certainly my delta t must be much smaller than tau, obviously, right? Otherwise I won't be able to describe a fluctuation. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, it turns out that delta t can be if I want, of the order of, uh, I can make it uh, something of the order of uh, 30 times smaller. Mm. It can be 25, it can be 40, depending on how accurate I want this uh, oscillation to be described. But the Verle algorithm in particular is quite stable uh, if you choose a delta t, uh, which is only 1 20th or 1 30th of the, um, of the actual period of oscillation of your system. Okay, so in practice, uh, your system will be a complicated system and may have different uh, time scales. Uh, take, of wa take water, for example, right? Water, liquid water, there are several time scales. There is a time scale of uh, you know, diffusion, uh, which is normally a fraction of picoseconds. Uh, and then there is a time scale, the, the fastest one is the time scale of uh, the vibrations of the OH bond, for example. This is actually extremely fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are different time scales. So how do you choose actually your delta t in a molecular dynamic simulation? Well, you need to integrate all your degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do that, uh, you need to be able with your delta t to describe uh, the fastest ones. Once you describe the fastest ones, you of course be able to describe also the slowest one with, uh, with the Verlet algorithm. So as a matter of fact, uh, your delta t must be a fraction of the order of 20, 30 times smaller than the fastest oscillation of your characteristic time of your system, okay? You have to pick the fastest oscillation time in the case of a water molecule, for example, that would be the stretching of the OH bond. Um, and then that defines your uh, minimal time scale that you have to be able to reproduce in terms of oscillations and then your delta T will be uh, correspondingly uh, set. Right, and in some sense, uh, those of you who might have uh, be, I mean, might be familiar with the simulation of water, you might now understand why a number of water molecules, uh, water models, uh, assume that the molecule is a rigid object. Mm -hmm. uh, Ninety percent of the molecular models for water used in molecular dynamics assume that the water molecules is a rigid object. Right. Of course, by doing that, you're introducing a lot of approximations because you're not you're not looking at the dynamics of the water molecules. But in practice, you immediately see that this gives you a huge advantage in terms of delta t, because you can actually now, you can forget about the fast oscillations of the stretching of the bonds, and you can only integrate, you only need to integrate the, the dynamics of the uh, relative motion of the, uh, of the water molecules and rotations, which is much slower. And therefore, this allows you to use a delta t, which is much longer than the one you would have to use if you wanted to integrate uh, 
in integrated, um, the, the, the short one. Okay, good. So uh, let me now uh, move on and uh, let me again share the screen um, and show you, um, uh, let me see. Okay, right. So this is a standard protocol of, uh, uh, of a molecular dynamics uh, simulation. You first uh, um, initialize uh, your atomic positions, you need to give some initial uh, positions and velocities because you remember, I mean, in the algorithm, you need to know, well, either the velocities or you have to give the positions at time t and, and time zero and time delta t, which is sort of equivalent to given velocities. That initializes your, uh, your simulation and then you, uh, you start running your, your simulation. Now, of course, you, if you want to study your system at a given temperature, you have to choose atomic positions and velocities that are you know, as much as possible close to what you think is going to be thermal equilibrium at, uh, uh, in your system, right? Uh, for example, it doesn't make sense to start, if you want to study a solid, a crystal at, uh, I don't know, room temperature, it doesn't make sense to start from the uh, uh, crystalline positions because this is not a good, you know, uh, 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 a representation of your system at finite temperature. At finite temperature, the atoms will be already displaced from their position. Similarly, the initial velocities, um, you can actually choose them. This is simple. This is simpler. I mean, choosing velocities, you can actually do it quite straight in a straightforward way because you can just sample the Boltzmann distribution. So you can choose initial velocities that are somehow chosen to represent, uh, to, to, to describe the uh, Boltzmann distribution, okay? So you start with your simulation, you start calculating your forces and you start evolving your uh, trajectory using Verlet's algorithm. And how much you need to wait? Well, if you are interested in reaching thermal equilibrium, there are, I mean, different uh, goals that you can give yourself. I mean, there's some, I mean, if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're only interested in looking at vibrational frequencies of a molecule, for example, you're not, you're not interested in reaching thermal equilibrium. You just want to know, you know, the, the period of the oscillation of, uh, of the molecule. But in most cases, you're interested normally in study systems at thermal equilibrium. So what you do is you let your system evolve until the system uh, reaches some sort of thermal equilibrium. And certainly you want the system to lose memory of what was the initial configuration because that initial configuration was chosen, you know, out of a guess. So you don't want that guess to affect uh, the uh, final result of your, of your calculation, okay? And then once you reach the um, uh, equilibrium, uh, you start, uh, uh, you know, accumulating averages of the observables you're interested in. Uh, here, this is just the generic, uh, uh, um, you know, definition of an observable. Let me give you one example. I mean, it could be the it could be the temperature, for example, the instantaneous temperature of your system. Temperature in in the, in the specific case of this uh, you know equation, uh, a for temperature would be just p squared, the sum of all p squared, hmm? the velocity squared. Uh, but you can also calculate other averages if you want, and you can average it over the uh, over the length of the simulation. Now, uh, it's interesting at this point to make somehow a connection with, the, with, the, with statistical uh, mechanics. I think this is an interesting consideration that uh, perhaps there's no time to go into any detail now, but uh, you're, also, you're of course familiar that uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the realm of uh, statistical physics, uh, averages are calculated in a rather different way, right? They're calculated as, uh, I mean, as averages over the, uh, uh, um, over the Boltzmann factor. Right, using standard techniques in, in, in statistical physics. So uh, the assumption here is that the molecular, in fact, it's, it's rather an assumption on the side of statistical mechanics. Uh, we know that the real system behaves like a, a Newton, uh, follows Newton dynamics. But if you uh, average your system over long times, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the assumption is that uh, this averaging will eventually be closer and closer to uh, uh, the averaging, the perfect averaging that you would achieve if you were doing perfect uh, statistical sampling of your uh, of your um, of your observable. Okay, so there is an hypothesis here, and there is a those of you who are interested. There is also um, uh, the assumption, the, I mean, the ergodic hypothesis uh, hidden behind this uh, this uh, equation between the two averages, because in 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 writing the right hand side, you're assuming that the system is free to sample all possible configurations uh, in, uh, that are available uh, in phase space. In molecular dynamics, uh, you never know because you might be stuck in some uh, you know, uh, local minima, for example, and you don't know whether another minimum exists as long as you're exploring with your dynamics only a certain minimum, okay? 
I just, I mean, this is not, I don't want to enter into it. There's, there's of course a huge, uh, you know, literature on this. Uh, 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 and I don't want, I just wanted to give you some hints that this is sometimes a problematic aspect that you need to, uh, that you need to consider. So um, let me again uh, show you in practice uh, uh, what happens. This is a simulation in which uh, the goal is to simulate your system at uh, uh, room temperature, right? 293 uh, uh, Kelvin. Uh, so you start from different initial conditions. Uh, you try to guess you know, the initial conditions uh, uh, in such a way that your, uh, 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 your, your system will, will, will reach uh, um, room temperature. But as you can see here, your initial guess is never perfect, right? It's, it's, it's a guess. So um, it is a fact that if you evolve molecular dynamics uh, simply using uh, um, Newton's equations, you're actually, this is now the instantaneous temperature that you calculate in your system. So um, let me just uh, uh, show it uh, here, uh, one second. <coughs> Oops. Sorry, sorry, time here to erase the. Uh, blackboard. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, what I'm uh, what I'm uh, calculating was uh, uh, the instantaneous temperature. Which is uh, uh, essentially, oof, uh, now I have to remember the factors now. Well, there's certainly a sum over the particles of uh, the, their kinetic energies, uh, bi squared, right? Uh, so this is, uh, um, well, I know this. I mean, the equipartition theorem, this is three over two uh, n number of particles kBT, right? This is from equipartition theory. So the instantaneous temperature is uh, now uh, one over, uh, uh, up, 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 um, two over three number of particles kB, okay? So uh, if I calculate my instantaneous velocities here, and I compute this object, I divide by the number of particles and by Kb, what I get is, uh, well, I can define it this way, right? And notice this value depends on the, uh, on the velocities at any given time. So it's not a constant. It will actually vary in time. Hmm? So let me go back now to the, um, the um, these uh, uh, curves. These are actually curves that show you the instantaneous temperature along different runs where essentially the difference was only the choice of the initial conditions. Mm. By the way, the choice of the velocities, as I said, is typically straightforward. You just choose, you just sample the Boltzmann distribution at the temperature you want. So here it was 293. But in terms of positions, there's no way you can guess with, with, ex, with exactly what would be the positions that sample the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, e to the minus beta uh, v, the potential part. So you can only guess it, right? You can try to displace the particles a little bit and try to guess what would be the equilibrium values. Uh, a tip, I mean, the value of the of the displacements, which gives you the final temperature that uh, uh, that you want. So you can see different choices of the of the initial guess lead actually to different values of the average temperature that the system reaches after quite some time after equilibration. Okay, what you see here is also the fact that it takes time, normally of the order of you know 10,000 steps in this particular case, to reach uh, what we can call equilibrium. At the beginning, you know everything will fluctuate because you started from a configuration which is not representative, which is not exactly representative of your statistical system at, at the given temperature. But after a while, uh, your system, system will uh, will uh, will uh, will uh, will reach a state which is. Um, uh, which is um, stable in some sense, uh, where the, the, the averages can be calculated and the temperatures will be different. Uh, uh, so this, of course, uh, raises an important uh, uh, question. And this is, um, how can I actually simulate my system? Uh, oops, uh, sorry, uh, stop sharing here. How can I actually simulate my system uh, at a given temperature? Right? You don't want to you know, do a trial and error. You, you want to simulate your system at room temperature. You don't want to you know, start uh, uh, with, with different guesses and then choose the one that gets closer to room temperature. 
Now, now comes the, uh, uh, the concept of uh, simulating, doing molecular dynamics uh, uh, in different ensembles. Okay, so, so far, I've essentially described molecular dynamics as a solution of Newton's equations. Now, Newton's equations, as you know, conserve the energy, right? The total energy of the system, that is kinetic energy plus, uh, sorry, I'm using here kinetic, total energy in a different uh, meaning than in our standard ab initio. Uh, here, for me, total energy is the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, right? In classical mechanics, if you evolve a system with Newton's, with Newton's equations, that energy is conserved. Right, so we call these simulations we call them uh, microcanonical uh, simulations. Okay, so a simulation where energy is conserved, we call them microcanonical. Microcanonical. Okay, but sometimes what you want is simulation in which instead temperature is. Uh, I wouldn't say conserve, but I would say where it's uh, the, the, the simulation reaches uh, samples, uh, the macro, the, the, um, the canonical ensemble, okay? I'm using here conserved, uh, uh, but it's not actually conserved because temperature will always, uh, uh, what, what I mean by that is a simulation in which I'm actually sample, sampling the canonical ensemble at a given T that I can give at the beginning of the simulation, okay? At given t. This is not what we what we did a, a minute ago. A minute ago we did this, and we we didn't know what the final temperature was. Now we want to do something else. We want to do a simulation, a canonical simulation, at the at the target temperature that I impose to my system. Now the trick to do that, and there are several tricks to do that. I'm just showing one because uh, there are plenty of uh, tricks to do molecular dynamics in the canonical ensemble. Let me just you know describe what very very qualitative terms. Uh, how one goes about uh, doing that, uh, right? You have uh, your uh, um, uh, uh, equation, which is the Newton's equation. But what you do is in addition to your, to your force, uh, you add a friction term, right? A friction term is proportional to the velocity of your particle, right? And you modulate uh, your uh, friction in such a way that you reach exactly the same temp the temperature you want. Okay, so if your instantaneous temperature is above the target temperature, then you switch on the uh, friction. Vice versa, if the temperature is below the uh, target temperature, you actually change the sign to this friction and you accelerate your particles, right? You make gamma uh, negative, and in this way, you actually accelerate your particles. You give an acceleration which is proportional to the velocity. So the trick here is how can I modulate uh, gamma in such a way that I reach a target temperature. Mm -hmm. Now it turns out, and there's of course a plenty of literature on this, and I can you know, uh, point you to the correct literature, is that uh, the best way to do this is to actually do it in a slightly different ways than I describe it here. And by saying that this actual gamma is the derivative of an object which evolves um, with this equation essentially, where this is the difference between the instantaneous temperature and the target temperature. Okay. So now this is a slight variant of what I described before, but it still goes in the right direction because if the instantaneous temperature is above the target temperature, I want gamma to be positive, you know, to increase, right? Because I want the friction to start acting on my on my velocities, on my acceleration here. Vice versa, if the instantaneous temperature is below the target temperature, this becomes negative and gamma gets reduced until it becomes negative and accelerates the, uh, the, 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 the particles, right? Now, it turns out that this mathematical framework is an extremely nice mathematical framework that you can show it samples exactly the canonical distribution at, uh, at a given temperature. And there is actually a nice mathematical proof that was uh, uh, derived by Nozé in the, um, I believe in the 70s, um, probably early 80s or late 70s. Okay, so this, this sort of uh, algorithm actually goes under, under the name of uh, the Nozé thermostats. So these are called thermostats in general because uh, these are uh, algorithms that allow you to sample the, uh, the um, the, the canonical distribution while you're doing 
and molecular dynamics. Now, we have to be careful. If you do this, you'll be sampling the canonical distribution, but you'll be completely losing the real dynamics of your system because you're introducing a term which is totally fictitious. It's nothing to do with the physics of your system. It's something that you're introducing to uh, make your calculation uh, uh, go in sampling the canonical ensemble, okay? So if you do this, you'll be able to reach the canonical ensemble, but you forget about uh, extracting dynamical information from, uh, from your trajectories, right? So the frequency will be completely, well, completely. They will be slightly different with respect to the real frequencies of your system. The diffusion coefficients will not be the real ones, okay? So in practice, what you do is you first uh, start with this framework, with the canonical uh, simulation. And then at some point, uh, you just uh, switch off your thermostat and you let the system evolve uh, freely. Hopefully the temperature in the micro canonical ensemble will be very close to the temperature. Is this, if the system was equilibrated, was at equilibrium, will be very, very, very close to the temperature you fixed uh, in the canonical, in the simulation done with the canonical ensemble, okay? This is thermostats. And of course, there are um, many different uh, um, um, uh, uh, applications of this concept of, uh, of thermostats. Uh, you can actually extend this uh, not only to temperature, but you can extend it also to pressure, for example. You can this, I mean, microcanonical simulations are, you know, the cell is fixed, everything is fixed, energy is conserved. There's no chance the system can say, change the volume or change, you know, or change the pressure. Uh, well, actually the pressure will fluctuate, but the volume will essentially remain fixed. So there are uh, techniques which uh, essentially are, are all inspired by uh, this concept of thermostats that you can apply to sample other thermodynamical ensembles. Uh, for example, the constant pressure ensemble. Mm -hmm. I'll show you an example right now of what uh, um, let me share the screen again. Okay, let me see. Yes, this one, for example. Uh, this is this is uh, uh, something that was introduced by Michele Parinella and Israman in the, uh, the early eighties. And it's uh, you see the similarity between what I showed uh, before at the blackboard, uh, the temperature, and and here now the pressure. So instead of uh, uh, considering now a friction part, uh, you consider the cell as uh, uh, varying in uh, in time. So H here is the uh, vector, this is the, actually the, the matrix that defines the three vectors uh, that define the simulation box. And you're giving now the freedom of, to the simulation cell to vary in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in shape, uh, you see. And uh, with a dynamics, and what you see at the bottom is the dynamics of the cell now, of the H, uh, uh, matrix, which is driven by the unbalance between uh, the instantaneously calculated uh, uh, stress tensor, okay, the equivalent of the instantaneous temperature in, uh, in constant temperature simulations, and the pressure, the target pressure that you want to achieve. In other words, uh, if the system will reach an equilibrium only when, uh, and actually the, sh the shape of the cell will reach equilibrium, only when the internal stress is equal uh, to, the, uh, to the target pressure, okay? So this is a mechanism to drive your simulation towards uh, the target values of the, um, you know, the thermodynamic variables you want, to, uh, you want to fix, which is temperature in the previous case, and it is uh, uh, pressure in this uh, uh, particular case, okay? Let me uh, stop sharing here. Okay, now <clears throat> I just wanted to, uh, you know, um, give you one example of uh, uh, quantities that you may wish to, uh, to, uh, to calculate out of, uh, of um, a molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, a temperature is one, of course, and I just showed it before. You may wish to compute uh, the instantaneous temperature and to monitor the instantaneous temperature while you're evolving uh, your, uh, your trajectory with time. And this is actually a very good way to determine whether you've reached the uh, equilibrium because uh, the fluctuations of the temperature tend to, uh, you know, um, remain, uh, say, constant uh, around the given value, which is the, uh, the equilibrium value of the temperature. By the way, um, uh, you will never get rid of fluctuations in your simulations, right? Even the instantaneous temperature uh, will always vary in time. What you need to make sure is that the, its average remains constant. This is equilibrium. But the instantaneous value of the temperature will, of course, always fluctuate. And the fluctuations 
will actually be, it can be shown, will be proportional to the uh, uh, um, inverse square root of the number of particles of your system. Okay, so the oscillations of the uh, of the instantaneous uh, temperature. Uh, this is actually quite clear if you think about the, think about a single particle, right? Think about just a single uh, harmonic oscillator. In a single harmonic oscillator, there is essentially only one type of dynamics, uh, this one, right? And the uh, uh, the um, the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of your system will go from a, a maximum value when the particle is at the bottom of the potential to a zero when the particle is at the top of the potential, right? If it oscillates like that. So you see that with one particle, temperature, temperature, whatever is the meaning of temperature for one particle, which of course you have to be very careful, right? Because temperature is only defined in the thermodynamic limit, of course. But I mean, let's imagine that you do a simulation with a single particle, an harmonic oscillator, you immediately see that the value at least of the kinetic energy, let's not even call it temperature, uh, oscillates between zero and the maximum value forever, right? So in some sense, the fluctuation of this uh, temperature is uh, of the same order as the average value, which is which is half of it. Okay, so you see the fluctuation is essentially equal to the to the instantaneous value of the so to, to the average value of the temperature for one particle. If your system is composed of many particles, uh, these fluctuations will reduce, 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 and in the thermodynamic limit, uh, you will essentially have a, a constant uh, uh, temperature for the average and also for the instantaneous temperature. But it's case like one over square root of the number of particles in your system. Okay, uh, let me give you another example of observable uh, that you can that you may wish to calculate. I'm not sure whether this will be uh, considered in the tutorial, but it's actually a very common exercise, in uh, especially when you study liquids. And this is the so-called pair correlation function. So you look at if you have a system of particles. Uh, I'm mentioning this because this is an extremely common type of observable. Uh, you have a liquid. Let me let me say you have a liquid, and well, you sit on a given particle now. You sit on this particle, for example, and you look at all the distances that uh, you have between this particle and all the other particles, right? Like this. And you construct a probability distribution that uh, at, the, at the given distance r from a given particle, okay, from this, you have another particle. Okay, so you just look around yourself and you essentially, yeah, you do it actually through an histogram uh, in, in practice. But if you're, if you're average over several uh, uh, steps, what you will obtain is something typically of the type uh, of, uh, of this type. Okay. And this is quite universal. I'm showing this because this is a rather universal behavior for essentially all, all systems. What this is showing is that uh, for example, there is essentially zero probability that two particles come in contact, right? Well, if in contact, you mean really coming in contact at zero distance, right? You have always repulsion at some point uh, between two particles. You also have always a, a maximum probability of, of for particles to, to be at a given distance, right? This distance is normally the distance that particles take in the solid, nearest neighbors in the, in the solid, right? In the liquid, there is always a reminiscence of uh, the fact that you have a shell, that you have some type of bonding, uh, regardless of the system you're studying. And so you always have a maximum of the probability at the distance, which is, uh, you know, of the order of a few angstroms, which is the typical distance of two particles uh, in, uh, 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 when, they come, when they approach uh, each other. And then you have fluctuations, which eventually tend to a constant. Uh, the constant, of course, comes from the fact that you feel in the disorder system. If you look uh, sufficiently far away from yourself, uh, you're essentially going to see an average distribution which corresponds to the density of your system. So you won't be able to recognize fluctuations, uh, systematic fluctuations, uh, due to the, to, to the fact that there is a, uh, you know, a, a, a memory of yourself uh, in that particular position. Okay, so this distribution normally stands to a constant to one to the density of your of your system. Okay, so this is called pair correlation function, and it's one of the most popular um, pair correlation function. It takes also other names. Okay, it's called it's called GeoBank. Now I don't know how we're doing with time, so it's nine fifteen. Um, um, maybe, um, I think it's probably, I mean, I don't like to talk for uh, one hour and a half. So is it okay if we take, uh, say, five minute break? So you can go to the you know, toilet if you need, you can get a glass of water or whatever. So can I suggest that we stop here briefly for five minutes and we reconvene in uh, 
five minutes, which for me is 9.30. Let's do 9.35, okay? Yeah, fine, fine, okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, not 9.35. Uh, yeah, it's fine, why not, yeah. 9.35, okay? Yes. Good, okay, so I'll, um, what do I do? I'll write it here. We reconvene at nine thirty five AM. Of course, Central European time. So in five minutes, approximately six minutes. Central European summer time. Uh, okay, whatever. Uh, it's uh, GMT <laughs> plus two. Okay, see you uh, in a moment. Okay, I think we should start now. Can I start? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. So uh, first, I guess there was a question on the chat um, about the difference between Nose and Nose Hoover. Uh, I've been using the word Nose just because of historical reasons. Nose was the one who actually came up with the proof that uh, uh, the, the thermostat samples the canonical ensemble. But in fact, the, the, the scheme as I presented is actually called now uh, as Nose Hoover. Hoover gave some important contributions in the, uh, in the definition of the algorithm. So the, it's in, in fact, there are several different flavors of these uh, thermostats. I've only shown this qualitative, very sort of poor main uh, description of, uh, of, of the thermostat. But you're right, it's called actually in practice, it's called Nose, uh, Nose Hoover. Okay, so um, this is the second part now of my of my lecture, and this is now going to focus on the potential, right? That we are in a Benicio community or a place where a community that wants to learn uh, how to use a Benicio method. So uh, this is the place where a Benicio comes into play now. Uh, let me just give you a brief uh, historical, um, uh, you know, um, excursus of uh, of how the field of uh, potentials, uh, force fields, interatomic potentials. Uh, um, you know, was was I mean developed over the years. Uh, at the beginning, molecular dynamics was essentially just done what we call classical molecular dynamics. That is, it was uh, the first uh, calculations were done with were with uh, uh, interatomic potentials, uh, 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 which were written as sum of pair interactions uh, in the 60s at least, and then in the 70s uh, we started people started to introduce. Uh, some environmental uh, uh, variables into the definition of the potential. It was only in, in, the, in the 90s, I would say, with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, breakthrough uh, made by uh, Karen Parinello that the people have started to use the ab initial potential, uh, 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 you know, um, concretely in, 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 in molecular dynamics. And it's uh, the last uh, 20 years have been something that, uh, in fact, uh, slightly goes back to the, to the beginning in the sense that the people are now uh, uh, constructing uh, interatomic potentials based on the ab initio data uh, 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 to, uh, to um, in what we call, uh, you know, ab initio based uh, uh, molecular dynamics. But let me just, I mean, briefly go back to the to the beginnings because this is very instructive also from 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 a number of points of view. So, um, what is the concept? The concept is that um, uh, suppose you don't know anything about uh, about uh, the um, uh, the potential, well, the first thing that comes to your mind is to say that uh, the energy of interaction between two particles, uh, uh, well, to first approximation, perhaps, it can be written as a sum of uh, pair interactions. That is, atom I interacts with atom J uh, with a given potential. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, if I can now uh, stop sharing and I'll go back to, the, to my... Uh, if you take any pair of atoms, Okay, any pair of atom in the periodic table, and you look at uh, the energy of interaction between uh, two uh, atoms. Well, it, it's quite uh, one can come up with a quite universal uh, description of this interaction, which certainly has you know a repulsive wall at short distances, right? Atoms, any pair of atom 
beyond the given distance, they will start to repel each other for a number of reasons, right? Uh, power repulsion, um, um, nuclear, uh, you know, repulsion, and so on and so forth. So there is always a steep uh, uh, repulsion wall at very short distances, much shorter than chemical bonds, for example. Then at long distances, we also know that at least neutral systems, they all, that's actually a, an exact statement, and two neutral systems, they always attract with, uh, with something that goes like one over d to the sixth, right? This is the famous Van der Waals uh, coefficient. In fact, it's the, inter the long distance interaction between any pair of uh, neutral objects. It goes like this, like uh, minus one over d to the sixth. So these are quite universal statements, right? Any pair of atoms would do that. Now, if you just you know, join these lines analytically, you will have to you realize that there will be a point where there is an equilibrium, right, at some distance. And of course, this corresponds to a given uh, so energy of equilibrium between any pair of particles. So again, this is any pair of, uh, of particles, any pair of atoms in the periodic table, with probably one or two exceptions. Okay, where, where, the, where, the, where the difference is coming to play is when, it, of course, if you choose different atoms, is uh, what is the distance and what is the depth of this uh, well. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that covalent bonds, uh, atoms that are interact with a covalent bond, like carbon, for example, the distance is very short. Okay, the distance in carbon is uh, about one point something angstroms, uh, and the depth of this uh, energy is, is also quite uh, quite large, it's of the order of electron volts in the case of chemical bonds, right? So this universal curve has, you know, it's, it's a short and it's very deep in the case of uh, covalent interactions, but take helium, for example, right? Take two uh, helium atoms, their interaction is extremely weak. So the depth of this potential is less than, it's millivolts, and in fact, even less depending on the, on the rare gases. And the average equilibrium distance can be several angstroms, 10, 20, 50 angstroms, the equilibrium distance between to pair of completely neutral and 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 I mean like 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 rare gases. So while this universal core curve in shape qualitatively is the same, the actual quantitative aspects of this are, uh, can be can be quite different across different uh, uh, atoms in the periodic table. So let me go back now to my um, to my um, slide um, here. <clears throat> so if I assume that the two particles in my system interact with the pair potential, I write the sum of the energy, I mean the total energy as a sum of pair interactions, making sure I don't count interaction twice. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then of course, uh, I, I, uh, uh, the, 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 the next step if I want to improve this potential is to say, well, if, uh, how is the interaction between I and J affected by the presence of atom K, for example, right? Clearly, if I take atom K in this uh, figure here, and I move K, say, from the position you see it now, uh, to the position that is exactly in the center between uh, the connecting line between I and J, you will immediately realize that the interaction between I and J is going to be affected. Suppose it was a covalent bond, for example, between I and J. If I place an atom in the middle of a covalent bond, of course, the interaction between I and J is going to be affected. So you clearly see that the pair interaction approximation is really an approximation. And in principle, you need to correct it for the presence of a third atom. So this is what people, scientists did in the 70s. Uh, they started to construct uh, potentials that were essentially correcting the pair interactions by including three body terms uh, that were supposed to correct uh, the pair interactions for the effect of uh, a third atom, K, in this particular case, depending on the position, of course, of atom K uh, with respect to atom I and J. Well, you immediately realize that that's a never ending story, right? Because uh, even if you now correct it with the presence of atom to, of a third atom, you can say, well, but the interaction between I, K, and J is going to be affected by atom whatever, L. Right? So there's going to be a fourth atom, which is going to affect, depending on where the fourth atom is, the interaction between I, K, and J. So you must, in principle, include also a term that, uh, that corrects the third order contribution with the fourth order contribution, four bodies, five bodies, six bodies. In fact, uh, one thing, <laughs> it has been shown that this is not even, in some cases, it's not even converging as, as, a, as a sum of, uh, 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 as an expansion. Okay, so people have come up with uh, um, uh, 
quite different approaches in the, uh, later on, especially in the 80s. Uh, and especially um, um, uh, people have introduced uh, terms that uh, somehow uh, consider the fact that the atom, that the two atom, when two atoms interact, you have to consider in an average way the position of all the other atoms. This is uh, the, the, the uh, underlying concept, underlying the embedded atom models. Uh, you're embedding your pair interactions into uh, something, into an average field, which is the contribution, which essentially um, 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 gives the contribution of all the other particles uh, to the two body interaction between these, uh, these two specific atoms. I don't want to go into any detail about this. I mean, there's plenty of literature about, uh, about uh, how people have constructed empirical potentials for that. And of course, uh, you have several parameters that you need to fix uh, in, in, the, in deriving your empirical potential. And historically, this was done, especially in the 70s and 80s by fixing those parameters to experimental uh, values, uh, um, such as, for example, melting temperatures, equilibrium lattice spacings, uh, dynamical properties, and, and so on and so forth. But let me now come to the ab initio potentials. And let me actually uh, stop sharing this uh, because I'm, I need to use the blackboard now. Um, so the, the breakthrough came uh, when, uh, uh, I wouldn't say people realized because that was obvious to everybody, but when people started to become, uh, when it started to become possible to say that the potential could be evaluated entirely ab initio instead of, uh, uh, right. So what we want to do in our new in our in our, in our molecular dynamics, as let me remind you, is that we want to solve uh, uh, Newton's equations and we want to uh, uh, calculate the force. But we know that the force is essentially the, the derivative with respect to the um, coordinate of a particle of some sort of energy, hmm, which is not only a function of our i, of course, but it's a function of uh, uh, all the particles in my system. Oops. I need to do this, uh, uh, R1, R2, blah, 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 Ri, the particle I'm interested in, and Rn, the final, I mean, if I have n particles in my system, okay? This is a very important concept, okay? So the energy of my system is, of course, a, a function of the position of all the particles in my system. If I move one, the, energy, the total energy will change, right? And when I calculate the force, I need to calculate the derivative with respect to one of these uh, uh, variables. Mm? And this will give me the force acting on, the, uh, on, on I. As I've seen before, uh, as you've seen before, uh, uh, the, in, historically, people have described this as a sum of pair interactions or some embedded uh, 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 scheme or so on and so forth. But the truth is that this one was able to evaluate this total energy of the system for a given configuration of the atoms ab initio, that would be the solution to the problem. And in fact, this is what uh, we do when we do ab initio molecular dynamics. We're actually calculating the total energy of the system. We're evaluating the force as you did in, uh, I think, last week. And then we use the force that was calculated uh, with ab initio uh, approximation, with ab initio uh, accuracy to evolve the, uh, uh, the, um, the um, molecular dynamics uh, of, uh, of, uh, of my system, mm -hmm. OK? Now, let me somehow elaborate a little bit on the complexity of, of this task, right? So I have my uh, box here um, and I have my particles here. Now I'm not going to call them atoms any longer, okay? I'm going to call them ions or nuclei because in an ab initio framework, uh, uh, the electrons are everywhere, right? I have the particles here. So this is, for example, a, a, a nucleus with, uh, with uh, a charge, uh, uh, Zi and mass Mi, okay, and position Ri, of course. So the points will be defined by will be our uh, what we used to call atomic positions, okay. But then inside this uh, uh, box, I have electrons everywhere, right? Well, let me just to be uh, a little bit more. Uh, let me assume that electrons are somehow localized uh, close to the atoms, for example, okay. So these are electronic distributions. Um, this could be, for example, a typical uh, you know, electronic distribution uh, in a system of particles where the particles are placed, the nuclei are placed in these positions. Okay? So in order to calculate this energy here, I need to solve my quantum mechanical problem for a given configuration of the, of the atoms. Mm? So this, of course, means that every time, so that every time I solve my, um, uh, my quantum mechanical problem, I have to find 
what is uh, the essentially the wave function of the electrons. So this is now the electronic wave function and it's the ground state wave function. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is going to be a function of all the uh, uh, electronic coordinates mm -hmm. or only one if we are in density functional theory. If you think in the many body framework, this is actually the collection of all the uh, position of the electrons. And notice that I'm using now small letters to describe positions uh, of electrons, okay? I'll be consistently using, as I said, capital letters for ions, atoms or nuclei, and small letters for, uh, uh, for electrons, okay? So uh, for example, if I'm describing this particular wave function, the orange wave function inside this, uh, 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 in this in the, inside this simulation box, um, I will describe it with, uh, well, let me use a collective index for all the electronic particles. But then I have to remember that this is parametrically dependent also on all the Ri positions, right? Because this wave function will be different depending on where the positions of the uh, nuclei are. Okay, so it's a wave function expressed in terms of, uh, as a function in terms of the uh, uh, electronic positions, one or N, depending on whether many body or mean field, uh, but also parametrically on the position of the nuclei. What do I mean by that? I, what I mean by that is if I change the configuration of the nuclei, I displace them, this will be different. And of course the wave function will be different because for every given configuration of the nuclei, I will obtain a different uh, wave function. And what I know of course, is that uh, this wave function is the solution of the uh, Hamiltonian problem. And the Hamiltonian is of course a parametric function of the uh, coordinates. Okay, so this wave function will be the ground state, uh, well, let me put the ground state here just to be clear, uh, of the Hamiltonian problem. And the Hamiltonian, of course, is defined uh, for a given configuration of the, uh, of the nuclei because it depends on where the nuclei are. I mean, the Coulomb potential or the pseudo potential will be placed uh, at the position of the nuclei. So this Hamiltonian depends parametrically on the position of the nuclei, its ground state, for the electrons will be given by the solution of this equation, okay? So as a consequence, the ground state will depend parametrically on the position uh, of the nuclei, okay? I hope this is clear, right? So I'm solving the quantum mechanics of the electrons, the ab initio problem, and I'm solving the quantum mechanics of the electron parametrically, that is by changing every time the uh, parameters in this uh, Hamiltonian, which is where the, uh, uh, the atoms are. Let me actually uh, show it to you a bit more uh, um, <clears throat> uh, with, with real equations uh, so that you can, there you go, okay? So uh, this is essentially what I just explained. The, 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 uh, the, um, the box at the, at the bottom uh, right of this slide gives you the parametric Hamiltonian, which depends parametrically on the position of the, uh, of the nuclei. And uh, the, uh, the energy, the total energy of the system is the ground state uh, energy of uh, the electronic problem for a given, for a given, um, um, for a given choice of the nuclear position. Now, when I now do more ab initio molecular dynamics, uh, what I have to remember is that uh, every time I solve this problem, I need to solve it once, I will have to calculate forces. Mm -hmm. And I'm normally using um, um, hellman feynman theorem to calculate forces. I don't need to go through hellman feynman theorem, I guess. I think you already saw that uh, uh, last week. So there are ways, efficient ways to calculate from the, to, from the uh, electronic ground state uh, its derivatives with respect to, uh, to, the, uh, to the coordinates. And then I need to evolve. I remember what we discussed uh, uh, at the beginning of the lecture. I need to involve my particles, right? So the next step, so if I now do a, a one molecular dynamic step, the nuclei will change a little bit, right? Will be displaced. This one will go here. This one will go here. This one will go here. So there will be small displacements. Uh, where small uh, depends, of course, on delta t. The delta t I chose, but it will be slightly displaced. Mm -hmm. Now, the next step of the molecular dynamics, I need to solve again the electronic problem, right? I need to go back here, change the Hamiltonian, find the ground state again, 
determine the ground state, determine the ground state energy, and recalculate the force. Okay, so I hope you get the flavor of the why why doing that initial molecular dynamics is so complex and so uh, you know time consuming because every time in principle you move the particles, you have to solve the electronic problem again. You have to find the ground state again of your system. Mm -hmm. uh, ground state energy, determine the forces, and then evolve uh, delta t, delta t, delta t, delta t. Okay, so you easily imagine that uh, uh, the complexity of this task is much, much higher than, for example, determining the forces based on a pair potential, right? The pair potential in, you know, in nanoseconds, any, you know, with any computer, you can calculate it for an arbitrary large number of particles. Here, of course, if your system has, I don't know, you know, a thousand atoms, you're simulating a system of a thousand atoms, that means calculating the ground state energy and forces of uh, uh, in a simulation box of 10,000, of a thousand atoms, right? So this may take actually quite a, quite a long time. So this is why ab initial molecular dynamics, of course, is limited, much more limited than classical molecular dynamics in terms of uh, sizes of the systems and length of the uh, simulations. Instead of doing, as I said at the beginning, you know, micro, even uh, milliseconds in the case of classical molecular dynamics, with ab initial molecular dynamics, you rarely go above one nanosecond of total dynamics. In fact, most simulations are of the order of 10 to 100 picoseconds in terms of total duration of the, uh, of the, of the molecular dynamics. And even in terms of sizes, you rarely go above 1,000 uh, particles in your ab initial simulation because that's you know it has to become quite consuming time consuming and resources consuming in uh, in practice okay now having said this however uh, I'm, I'm sure you're already seeing that we can take advantage of some uh, you know some facts uh, here i said at the beginning i mean i said a minute ago that you need every time you evolve the particles you need to recalculate uh, this uh, the ground state of your system yeah, that's right. But uh, if your particles move only very little, that is, if this distance is small, and it is small because we are evolving the particles with a small delta t in a continuous dynamics, then of course uh, the solution of this problem is going to be enormously simplified by the fact that I already know the solution of the problem at the previous step, right? In fact, as a guess, the wave function of the system, the entire system at the previous step is an excellent starting point for the uh, solution of the ground state problem at, in, at the next step. It's much better than starting from, uh, you know, random orbitals or some, even some educated guess of what could be the ground state, okay? So initial molecular dynamics takes a lot of advantage from the fact that you already know the solution of the previous step. And so when you evolve it, you can take advantage of that, uh, uh, of that, uh, of that solution, okay? In a, to speed up, uh, and there are various algorithms that allow you to do that uh, in an efficient way. Mm -hmm. Let me rephrase this problem in a slightly different uh, uh, sort of mathematical framework because this is very uh, useful to um, now understand what is uh, uh, Carparinello molecular dynamics. So let me, oops. Okay, what much time I have? Yes, a few minutes, almost done. Okay, let me now um, show you this. This is now um, the energy uh, of my system, the ground state energy of my system. Uh, as a function of uh, the, sorry, the energy of my system uh, as expressed as a psi h of r psi as a function of psi. Mm -hmm. So what am I doing here? I'm fixing ri, I'm fixing the configuration and I'm simply, you know, imagining what's happening to the energy that is to the expectation value of uh, uh, the Hamiltonian if I vary the wave function, okay? So I'm here in the realm of quantum mechanics, if you wish. There will be a ground state, okay? And this expectation value, we know already that it has some sort of minimum here, right? I mean, that's the variational principle of uh, quantum mechanics. If I evaluate uh, the energy as an expectation value of uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Hamiltonian on an arbitrary wave function, this arbitrary, this energy will always have to be variationally higher than the value uh, uh, I obtained for the energy at the ground state, okay? 
So this is my ground state. And we, I mean, this is just very qualitative description of what, uh, mind you, I, I'm using only one coordinate, but this is a Hilbert space, right? Because the wave functions are a Hilbert space. So you have to imagine this as an infinite dimensions in, uh, in uh, 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 not just as one, I'm just collapsing the wave function as if it was a one dimensional object, right? But it's an Hilbert space. So, but there is a minimum, right? At the corresponding to the ground state in quantum mechanics, if you fix the Hamiltonian, and now I'm fixing the Hamiltonian, uh, this corresponds to a minimum. Hmm? And of course, I mean, the, uh, I'm just rephrasing concepts that perhaps are very obvious to you, right? That quantum mechanics finding the ground state is equivalent uh, in a variational picture to identifying the minimum of this object in the space, in the Hilbert space of wave functions. And this is the ground state. Of course, a ground state, which will be uh, determined by whatever is the, the, the Hamiltonian I've been using here. I'm using the Hamiltonian for a given value of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, nuclear positions. And of course, there are several ways to find the minimum of a, of a quantum mechanic. I mean, variationally, I can do diagonalization in a, in a different framework. But I can think of uh, sort of seeing this as an optimization problem, as a minimization problem, in which, uh, uh, for example, if I start from a guess of the wave function here, let me, let me assume that the goal now is to find the ground state. I can start from a guess, a wave function, which is a guess here. And I can uh, try to identify where the minimum is. What do I do? Well, I need to know the derivative of this, right? If I want to determine where I need to move. But the derivative of this with respect to psi, that is the derivative of the, hmm? this is just quantum mechanics. It's, of course, it's a functional derivative, right? So this is, uh, forget about the factors, right? I'm really using, you know, hands waving arguments uh, is H psi. Right, the variational, uh, the functional derivative of the uh, of this object with respect to psi is h psi. Now it depends on. Comp I mean, forget about the details. But essentially, uh, 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 the uh, qualitatively, you can say that the the force, right? It is the force in principle. I mean, if you see it from a from a classical point of view, the derivative of your energy with respect to the variable I want to you want to optimize, which is the wave function, is h psi, which is this force acting, let me use force, but it's not really a force because we're acting, we're in the quantum space now. We are, we, are, we are seeing the quantum problem as a classical problem here, right? Optimization problem. We have a force which pushes the electrons towards the ground state in this direction. Hmm? And I can come up with uh, many algorithms. Once I know the force, I know the gradient. Hmm? I can use a uh, conjugate gradients. I can use uh, I can use steepest descent, for example. Let me just be very stupid and say that I want to find the minimum of this. Well, then I uh, I need to evolve my um, wave function from the guess following uh, uh, the gradient. Sorry, uh, mm, this is minus the gradient, right? The gradient goes up. This is minus the gradient. Okay, the one that pushes me towards the minimum, of course, I have to go again. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, so the force is minus the gradient. So um, if I, if I uh, imagine an algorithm which evolves with time, now it's a fictitious time because I'm, I'm just finding the, the ground state of a quantum problem and I'm introducing some sort of fictitious, I mean, uh, an algorithm time, uh, which says my velocity of this uh, particle, this object that I'm optimizing, uh, uh, um, goes with the force acting on it, right? This is called steepest descent. It's uh, one of the yes, most stupid and simplest algorithms that you can you can think about uh, in order if you want to minimize the minimize an I mean, finding the, the minimum of, a, of 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 an object with respect to a variable. And then you know, in several steps, uh, uh, if you do a discretization, you will eventually uh, find the minimum following this uh, uh, this uh, this gradient. Now, this is, of course, there are much, much more clever ways to optimize, to find the minimum of, uh, of a quantum problem. You can diagonalize, you can do lunches, you can do uh, conjugate gradients. I mean, quantum espresso has uh, several ways uh, to, to actually find the minimum. I'm, I'm here showing something which is extremely stupid, but it's going to be very uh, useful to understand now uh, Carparinello because of the following. Uh, let me actually make a, a small digression, which sounds a little bit uh, stupid and silly, uh, but it's the following. Suppose I now do, instead of doing this, I do this. Hmm? 
again, let me remind you that we are not in the classical space here. We are working with Hilbert spaces, okay? So I'm just imagining some infinitely dimensional field that evolves with this second order equation following what I call the force, which is the gradient of a potential along this uh, least trajectory. If I do this, uh, what will I obtain? Well, something a little bit different, right? Because this is now second order dynamics in an algorithm time. And so my particle or wave function, depending on how I want to call it, will start, well, it will start oscillating back and forth from here, boom, 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 right? So imagine this in a quantum space, right? This is the ground state. I'm just letting my wave function evolve around the minimum in this infinitely dimension um, Hilbert space, okay? This is what I would get. Uh, sounds silly, right? It sounds quite silly. Why should I do that? Why, do I, why would I like to do that? Well, there is one reason I may want to do that. It's that on average, if you think about it, if I evolve the wave function in this, on average, the wave function will be very close to the ground state on average. It will be oscillating, but on average, it will be very close to the ground state. So if I do this and I uh, evaluate the average value of the wave function, that's not going to be very far from, from, uh, from, the, um, from the actual ground state. Okay, we are ready now to move to Carparinello. And Carparinello can easily be understood if I now add the third dimension, which is now the uh, position of the particles, Ri. Once again, I'm collapsing everything into a single dimension, but it's a 3n dimensional space, right? That of the coordinates. In which sense? In the sense that once I found the ground state, and now remember our problem, our problem is to evolve the wave function, finding the ground state every time we move the atoms, okay? If I now introduce the, uh, uh, the variable, the, uh, the, uh, the, the nuclear coordinates, the atomic coordinates, once I find the ground state, I need to now move the particles, right? So I will now sitting, I will now be sitting at the position which is slightly displaced in Ri, right? I will have to move in this uh, uh, out of the blackboard in a different space. Everything will change. This will change, the Hamiltonian will change. So I will have to find another minimum, right? So, well, let me now move it a little bit here. So this will be a slightly different parabola it will be slightly displaced with respect to the, uh, to the original position. Its minimum will also be slightly different with respect to the original minimum, right? Will be somewhere here, for example, now I draw it a little bit different, but uh, in other words, this reflects a bit more what I said before. If I now want to minimize the wave function for a slightly different choice of the nuclear coordinates, I need to, I mean, the ground state will be slightly different, but the original ground state which was uh, this one here, now projected, this one will not be very far from the new ground state, uh, which is uh, this one here. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, I mean, I can see the problem of uh, finding the minimum of the quantum problem when the particles evolve in their positions as a problem of identifying the minimum of a, something which looks like a parabola, which actually moves with time according to uh, the position of the particles. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like, you know, having a particle of which you find the minimum here, or perhaps in a ball, for example, and then you move the ball and the ball changes a little bit, the minimum changes, the position of the minimum changes, and you want to continue to keep your ball, uh, your, your little particle at the bottom of this, uh, of this cup. Mm -hmm. So Carparinello comes into play when you say that you are actually evolving this um, and this is now the magic of, uh, of, uh, of Carparinello. Carparinello said, well, why don't we do this simultaneously? Why don't we evolve the Newton's equations for the particles and the, these fictitious, very strange equations for the electrons? Uh, simultaneously. In other words, why do we need to find every time we move this uh, parabola, always the ground state? And let's stay actually out of it and let's start to oscillate around the minimum, okay? While this parabola moves in space according to the evolution of the, uh, of the nuclear coordinates. Mm -hmm. So this is essentially the basic principle of Carparinello. Instead of looking every time for the minimum, which is very time consuming, because if you want to look for the minimum every time, 
every time you fix the value of the nuclear coordinates, you must find the minimum. So you have to solve a quantum mechanical minimization. Here instead, every step, you don't find the minimum. You just do H times Psi. It's a simple matrix uh, times vector operation. You don't have to diagonalize H. You don't have to find a minimum eigenvalue. You just do H times Psi, which is numerically extremely faster than finding the ground state every time. Now, if you do this, you know, uh, if you let these oscillations here be fast enough, okay, the particle will adiabatically follow the minimum of your parabola. But this has to be fast enough to follow adiabatically the minimum of your parabola. Okay, let me now just uh, you know, uh, summarize it uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, here. The time is almost uh, over. <clears throat> so, let me see. No, sorry, this is uh, non Feynman. I skipped that. Sorry. Here you go, and here you go. And now I'm essentially um, summarizing what I just said uh, uh, here at the blackboard. Okay, perhaps a little bit better from a graphical point of view, right? I'm evolving the electrons with this fictitious second order dynamics, uh, which keeps them, and you see now the blue line. Uh, this is the Carparinel evolution, close but never actually. In the ground, in the instantaneous ground state of the of the particles, mm -hmm. the red line instead is the so-called Born-Oppenheimer molecular dynamics. Okay, the, the molecular dynamics where every time you move the particles, you end up in the uh, you you find the ground state of your system. Now, very briefly, um, uh, can you tell the differences? Yes, there are some differences, and uh, here, for example, on the uh, on the right side, you see the, uh, no, sorry, on the left side, you see uh, the forces on the atoms calculated with the electrons in the ground state and the forces calculated uh, with the Carpanel approximation. They are not exactly the same, of course, because your wave function is not exactly the minimum. But what you can see on the right side is that uh, the difference is actually an oscillating function. So on average, the force on the particles uh, is uh, quite similar uh, to the force. And you can make this uh, as small as you want if you uh, say make the dynamics of the electrons uh, uh, fast enough. Okay. Um, I think I will uh, just stop here. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, I'll leave you with some uh, you know, basic uh, text about molecular dynamics, a little bit about the history, um, the, 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 the basic papers, and also a very nice and comprehensive uh, book uh, that was written by. Dominic Marx and Jörg Hütter about the initial molecular dynamics, where you'll find essentially everything you want to know. It's, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a bit old, but it contains really everything you need to know to run uh, um, initial molecular dynamics. And with this, I will uh, uh, stop here, and I'm not sure how it works here. Thank you very uh, much, Sam. Uh, uh, thanks, Sam. It works that normally we leave uh, uh, people from Zoom to raise their hand and okay. make questions directly if they, if they want. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, I can post to you on the chat some uh, a question from the streaming, like one uh, that is uh, here now. Um, approach of um, molecular dynamics to set the system in phase transition water. Um, okay. Uh, all right. This is a very complicated question. I mean, um, um, now studying phase transitions, unfortunately, requires. Uh, a huge uh, effort in terms of statistical sampling um, because you have to determine essentially the free energy of different phases and determining free energies is, is not straightforward, requires a lot of statistical sampling. So this is can be normally, you know, hardly done with ab initio molecular dynamics. So if your problem is to, uh, is to uh, uh, you know, study specifically a given phase transition, then I would probably do a, a initial molecular dynamics. But if your goal is to study, say, an entire phase diagram, uh, including liquids, uh, my suggestion would be to instead uh, use, uh, you know, classical potentials. Uh, and I, I didn't discuss it, of course. I just gave you a flavor at the very beginning. But you can now um, optimize uh, uh, classical potential based on the initial uh, data. And you can do it also now with uh, you know machine learning techniques. There are now a plethora of potentials that have been developed based on initial data uh, and and uh, say machine learning neural networks uh, 
and and, uh, and and so on and so forth. So the 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 my suggestion would be if you need a lot of statistical sampling um, to do it uh, with uh, um, uh, potentials that are uh, optimized based on the initial uh, trajectories and initial data. Okay, there is another question from Slack that I can forward you here on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, there you go. Okay, I want to do molecular dynamic calculation. What do you put on the table for consideration? Oops, 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 it's scrolling too fast. Uh, oh, the question is uh, the CPMD versus uh, born Oppenheimer. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, so it has to do with uh, um, your, uh, um, essentially, as, just as a summary, uh, it's a long discussion, but I can summarize it as follows. Uh, for insulators, it turns out that normally Carpanella molecular dynamics uh, works uh, better than born Oppenheimer molecular dynamics. Uh, for uh, metals or for systems with uh, small gaps, small electronic gaps, uh, it's the opposite. You better do uh, born Oppenheimer molecular dynamics. It essentially has to do with the curvature of this parabola that I was showing at the end of my lecture. Uh, for an insulator, uh, that the curvature of that parabola, parabola is very high. So the parabola is very steep. And so it's easy to uh, follow. The electrons have uh, an easy job in following adiabatically the, uh, the evolution of the nuclei. Uh, for metals, uh, the parabola is very flat because actually the curvature of that parabola is uh, the square root of the energy gap of your system. It's been, it's been shown. Uh, and so for metals, you better use born open diameter. It's, it's a bit of a trade-off. It depends also on the efficiency of your code, of course. Uh, if you have an extremely efficient code for born open diameter molecular dynamics, you better use born open diameter molecular dynamics all the way. Uh, one yeah. more. Thank you. There are two more. Yeah, there are two more that I already posted. Um, yes, okay, can I, uh, then I add, if I can, just one last uh, slide which addresses that uh, last question, if I can, uh, here, 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 okay. These are all the things I would have loved to tell you, but I didn't have the time to do. So the first question is, is actually the one that was in the chat that addresses the first one. Uh, I'm assuming here that you can do classical molecular dynamics on the nuclei. This is true for 99% of the atoms, but there are exceptions. You know, and uh, you know, helium is a very notable exception. You know, helium is a is a quantum fluid or has uh, extremely you know, important quantum effects. So yeah, you have to be careful. Uh, hydrogen, of course, rather, the lighter is the particle, the less you 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 you, you I mean, the, the more you have to be careful about uh, doing quantum dynamics for the uh, for the for the particles. So, and let me just take this opportunity to mention three more uh, topics that uh, for you, I mean, to think about. Uh, one is uh, how, I mean, I've been discussing essentially ground state dynamics, uh, but it's extremely interesting to also look at the dynamics of uh, particles when the, the, the electrons are in excited states. I mean, things of photochemistry, for example. Uh, I didn't discuss uh, how to accelerate sampling if, in case you want to jump from different uh, I just alluded to it when I mentioned the ergodic theorem. Uh, I'm mentioning these things because they're all uh, extremely fast expanding areas of research. So you might be interested in somehow looking at what's happening in these areas. And then only at the end, I mentioned this uh, uh, concept of uh, now building machine by using machine learning, building classical potentials, that is interatomic potentials, the way, uh, the way we used to do it in the 60s and 70s, but with parameters that are now determined based on a initial data. Um, okay, there were there are uh, two. I think one from the streaming and one from the Slack, and then we can close. So one is uh, how to do uh, melt uh, quiz, uh, quenching, and the other one is uh, uh, I posted it on you on on Zoom. If you want to answer, uh, where is it? Sorry. Um, where the first one is what? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, is this one here? How to do melt quenching? I'm not sure what. Uh, um, I guess uh, this is this refers to the um, to how we produce uh, um, amorphous systems. Uh, uh, we normally produce them uh, in simulations, at least, but also in the real in the real life by quenching uh, melts. And there's, I think the big question here is uh, how to um, somehow approach the time scales that are. Uh, required to produce correctly an amorphous system. I mean, ordinary glass is a typical example 
of a system that uh, is obtained by slow, even on uh, you know real time scales uh, uh, dynamics. It takes uh, minutes, if not seconds. I mean, I was born in Venice, so I know very well how to produce uh, uh, you know uh, arts uh, um, masterpieces with uh, with glass. Um, and it takes minutes, in fact, even hours to obtain the final product. So this is clearly outside of the uh, outside of reach for uh, uh, molecular dynamics, as a matter of fact, not to mention initial molecular dynamics. So there are techniques that, that uh, one can use to speed up uh, the quenching of melts uh, to obtain amorphous systems. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think it's the we can take the last question from uh, from the Slack channel. Is it possible to perform molecular dynamics by using the implicit method, which uh, the solution can converge at any values of time step. Sorry, sorry, say it again. Uh, is uh, it possible? I can, I can post it here so you can read. Yes, please. Okay, got it. By using implicit method, which solution can converge at any values of uh, uh, time step. I think this is what we uh, call born Oppenheimer molecular dynamics. So every step we find the um, uh, the uh, the ground state of the electronic wave function. Um, I guess I mean the the issue here is uh, to which precision you want to obtain the ground state of your function because of course I mean numerically you will never get exactly the ground state, and and that difference can be important. In fact, uh, one of the main problems of Born-Oppenheimer molecular dynamics is the fact that uh, your solution your you know, sorry, your uh, the error you're making in determining the, 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 the ground state is normally biased in a given direction in wave function space. And that introduces a systematic error in the determination of the ground state and the determination of the, uh, of the ground state energy. Something that the Carpanello method doesn't have because the Carpanello method has the wave function oscillating back and forth. So you're sort of you know, averaging out all possible errors you're making because of the fact that you're not exactly in the ground state. Okay, great. Uh, I think we can close it here. I would like to quote uh, a comment from the stream saying, uh, a great lecture, Professor Scandolo, very clear and captivating. Uh, really like the, uh, the, interactive, uh, the interactive aspect of the lecture. So thanks a lot. I think we reconvene at uh, uh, 10.35 uh, uh, with the Anson session. And thank you.